All right, good morning and good evening to everyone. Uh, welcome to our event uh, webinar this, this afternoon or you know, the morning or the, the evening. My name is Sean Alexander from the Department of African and African American Studies here at the University of Kansas. And again, I want to welcome everyone and welcome all of our participants. Uh, my uh, job here today is to do just very a very brief introduction and welcoming to everyone. Uh, then I will hand it off to uh, my colleague, Abel Chikanda, who will lead us in monitoring the session today, do brief introductions. The one thing I want to do for a business format before we start is uh, we will basically start with a 45 minutes to an hour of the panelists talking uh, amongst themselves. Uh, then we will open it up to for question and answers for the last uh, 30 minutes to 45. 45 minutes. There is a question and answer uh, link uh, in the Zoom. Please use the question and answer um, uh, link rather than the chat link uh, to put uh, your questions in there and we will make sure that they get to Abel and then to the panelists. So again, thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, I wanna acknowledge that uh, this, this is the 50th anniversary of our department, the Department of African and African American Studies here at the University of Kansas. And we have always been doing programs like this and we're very excited to have a program uh, like this. From our founding documents, I always like to, to cite that we, we, from the moment of our creation 50 years ago, we declared that we would speak to the urgency of the development of African peoples, both on the ancestral soil of Africa and within the Americas. And I think this program that we have today uh, speaks to that continued progress and approach for our, us as a department, uh, making the connection between the middle of the United States, Kansas, and the continent of Africa. Uh, we have always been combining uh, action and protest, uh, which is how our department was formed uh, out of student protests to develop it uh, with our uh, academe, with our uh, classwork, with our research. Uh, and again, I think today we'll speak highly of that and continued uh, experience that we've been doing for 50 plus years. So again, welcome. Uh, I look forward to the discussion and I'm going to hand this off now to my colleague, Abel Chikanda. Uh, good day and uh, welcome to this uh, ANSAS panel. Uh, my name is uh, Abo Chikanda. I am an assistant professor jointly appointed by the Departments of African and African American Studies and Geography and Atmospheric Science. So this uh, panel is uh, uh, titled Hashtag ANSAS, uh, Soresoke, uh, the people speak up. So this hashtag uh, uh, ends us, it's, uh, it has uh, uh, a bit of history. It started uh, uh, in 2017, uh, but it didn't generate uh, as much uh, interest uh, as it has done lately. I would, want, I would ask uh, the panelists to reflect on this uh, uh, recent uh, uh, reiteration of ends us. Why is it that it has become more vo vocal and uh, widely circulated? And do the, the, the protests, uh, the ANSAS protests, uh, um, speak to the cultural and structural conditions that generate uh, the violence of policing in Nigeria? And uh, uh, we have also seen, uh, even here in the US, uh, protests uh, taking place, uh, occurring. Uh, in the wake of uh, the killing of George Floyd, uh, what we know as the Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, if uh, any of you also see any connections between that and uh, what is going on uh, in, in Nigeria. And um, uh, another thing that I would also want to ask the, the, the panelists uh, is to reflect on uh, the, this hashtag uh, uh, answers. Uh, is it something that would say it's uh, something that's uh, peculiar to the case of Nigeria? Uh, do you see this uh, uh, having any resonance uh, uh, speaking to the uh, 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 broader African uh, continent? So I will um, briefly introduce uh, the four panelists that we have uh, um, uh, today. So uh, our first uh, 
uh, panelist is uh, Professor Jibrim uh, Ibrahim, uh, who is a senior fellow at the Center for Democracy and Development in Abuja. Uh, so if we can just uh, uh, send uh, some, uh, okay, so it looks like we don't have uh, the reactions. I just wanted you to send some thumb up, thumbs up, uh, but uh, looks like we can do so. Um, uh, so I'll ask him to give uh, uh, a much uh, fuller introduction of himself and uh, 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 his work uh, when he starts uh, 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 his uh, brief remarks. And the second pan panelist is uh, Ayodele Olofituande. Sorry if I mispronounced uh, your name. And uh, Ayo uh, is a queer writer and author of uh, La Kiriboto Chronicles. And our third panelist is uh, Fiaso Soyombo, uh, a former managing director of uh, uh, Sahara Re Re Reporters and winner of the 2020 Get Field uh, People Journalism uh, Prize. Uh, and uh, finally, we have uh, uh, Katie Ryan, who's an associate professor uh, of African and African American studies and geography and atmospheric science. Uh, here at the University of Kansas. Uh, so uh, let's start uh, with uh, uh, Professor Jibrim uh, Ibrahim. I would give you 10 minutes to give uh, uh, your opening remarks. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, if you can start by uh, 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 talking briefly, uh, giving us uh, a brief introduction of your work. Uh, over to you, Professor Ibrahim. Thank you very much. Uh... Abel, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thanks for organizing this important uh, discussion on a social movement that has really been shaking Nigeria over the past uh, few weeks. Uh, my background is political science. I taught for 20 years in Amadou Bello University in Zaria, in Nigeria here. And my focus uh, in terms of uh, academic interest has been on the states and uh, democracy. The first point I'd want to make is that there's a very old tradition in Nigeria from the colonial times that security forces in general and the police and army in particular must be able to show brutality to subjugate the population. And if up till today we are talking of brutality is because there's an old history of that. When you look at anthropological works from the 1920s and 30s, the colonial authorities made efforts to identify ethnic groups that are strong and brutal and could therefore do the pacification that was essential to establishing colonial rule. The second point I want to make is that this tradition has been perpetuated under, after independence precisely because that has been the basic training manual in the security agencies. Three years ago, I served in a presidential panel where we investigated uh, violations of human rights by the armed forces. And we taught the whole country and everywhere we went, it was the same messages of brutality and the population that is caught between two sets of brutality. One from security forces, the other from uh, armed uh, militants, bandits, uh, jihadists, who are also exercising brutality towards the people. So the community, the population has always had to uh, maneuver itself between these two uh, types of brutality. My final introductory uh, remark has to do with 
police capacity for its own work. 40 years ago, there was a decision to remove the uh, investigative uh, arm of the police that was doing intelligence work and set up first uh, the, uh, I mean, the, what we call the DSS, it had an earlier name, it was NSO before, National Security Organization. So the state thought, you have a specialized agency doing intelligence and you have the police uh, doing uh, uh, prosecution as it were. But that division happened. What it did was it em emptied the police of the capacity for forensic work, for uh, real uh, investigation. And with the dissolution of the intelligence arm of the Nigerian police, the only element left in the police force, therefore, was this brutality and the method of police work traditionally, especially on criminal matters, is profile a group that could have done it, torture them, make them confess, and you've got your culprit. So that's the general background. And that's why when NSAS started as a movement, essentially to protect the rule of law, to protect human rights, the response of the police has always been that we cannot dissolve this uh, arm of the police. When pressure mounted, as it did in 2017, they announced dissolution, but never did. And again, uh, last year, uh, in January, there was a lot of pressure to dissolve it. And their response was to announce they have dissolved it and continue with normal work, which is uh, police uh, brutality. Now, the specifics of NSAS is that it's not the youth in general, but what one could call the progressive wing of the youth, the upward, upwardly mobile, who were profiled because they have good cars, because they have expensive telephones, and therefore from whom you can extort money. And when they discover that there is this uh, group of young uh, Nigerians, because of uh, pecuniary gain, they put a lot of focus on targeting them. And this group is savvy. This group uh, and this is a group that was just discovering that if you don't fight police brutality, state brutality, you continue to suffer. The specificity here is that our generation of Nigerians grew up under military rule. So we are used to that as the life we encountered and fought against throughout. This, was a, this is a generation that was born just before the advent of democracy. And throughout their lives, they've only known democratic rule. But then came to find out that democratic rule is often emptied of its essence. And therefore, we are able to organize this campaign in a way that was very uh, effective. I think uh, the state was shocked at their response. The reason why the state was uh, shocked was that when the movement became very strong, and the president uh, finally got the message that this is not a movement you can dismiss. You have to respond to their demands. And the president directed that, okay, he accepts their five demands. But the demonstrations continued for the simple reason that they've had that story before, that they've had announcements that SARS had been disbanded. And 
and nothing really happened and nothing changed. Uh, so because of that, they wouldn't take yes for an answer. They wanted to see action. When the president realized they were not taking his yes for a yes, he got quite upset. And you recall he refused to address the nation after repeated calls to really things got out of hand. Two things happened to the ANSARS uh, movement. Immediately it started, the Nigerian political class has two ways of responding. One way of responding is repression, uh, either directly by the police or introducing thugs, paid thugs to disrupt the uh, demonstration. And they did that very effectively against uh, ANSARS. The second way they know how to respond is to change the narrative. And that's by introducing our issues of ethnicity, religion, uh, regionalism into the debate and diverting attention from the core issues on the table into issues that this person is after you, this is a regime change issue, and that was how both uh, in Lagos and the West, as well as up north here, shortly after the movement became very strong, there was this determined effort to change the narrative. And this is where we go into the larger Nigerian reality. The youth that started NSAS is educated, it's savvy, it was focused on liberal demands, essentially around rule of law. But Nigeria has over 100 million people living in extreme poverty. Most of them uh, are very young. Most of them are living on the margins of society, what I would call a precariat. And most of them are looking for opportunities to strike in terms of their survival. Once the uh, government and its supporters introduced the issue of thugs, this larger group of Nigerian youth that has been in deprivation for so long, that have also been victims, thought it was an opportunity. And here, of course, COVID played a role. Uh, for the past uh, six months, the issue on the table is that massive palliatives have been provided to feed the poor tied at home because of uh, COVID. They had about this massive distribution. Nobody saw anything. And that became an opportunity for them to come and liberate what they could liberate for themselves. And it was at that point, I think, uh, the dynamics developed uh, on its own and you have this descent into generalized uh, banditry by a youth that's very eager to come out and get something for itself. The general belief in this uh, country is there any opportunity you have to access anything from government, legal or illegal, do it if you can. The situation created was one in which uh, they could do that. The larger issue for me really is that the journey is out of the bottle in this country. The youth now know their strength in all their complex configurations. Let me make the point that for the past 11 years, the youth have been engaged in the jihadist uh, insurgency in the Northeast. They've been out uh, doing things and holding the state uh, to ransom quite successfully. Over the past five, six years, what we call the farmer had uh, clashes. Again, it is another branch of the youth that has decided that they have a response to injustice and inequality in Nigerian society. They see the posh life these people live, and they suddenly realized if they have an AK-47, 
They could kidnap people and take ransom. They could steal what people have. So we are in a situation in this country that where the youth are getting are out of the bottle, they are out in the streets, they are looking for opportunities, and they are not very uh, choosy in terms of whether they remain on the realm of legality or they get out of it. Uh, these are my opening remarks, thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Ibrahim. Uh, at this stage point, I will uh, uh, ask uh, Ayodele to uh, give, uh, give uh, some opening uh, remarks. Uh, your Dele, I think you are muted. Oh, sorry. Oh, hi, okay. hi. Okay. My name is Ayodele Olofintuade. I'm a writer. I'm a lesbian. I'm a feminist. I'm, I have been a journalist for, for so many years, uh, investigative reporter, and then I became a researcher and my primary research in the past two, three years has been um, queerness in Yoruba, in Yoruba, um, in Yoruba race and um, feminism in the Yoruba race and protests that has been carried out even pre-colonialism and post-colonialism. And I have worked um, with um, a lot of um, journals and and um, my new set of books are coming out by next year. Um, I, I listened to to Professor Jibrin Ibrahim and I've heard everything he said. Um, I'd like to introduce a new dimension to this discourse, the dimension of the fact that violence is permeates every aspect of the Nigerian society, from the way the from the way the government is set up to the way the family unit is set up, I'd like to start from talking about um, some some youths. Um, some um, I think it was earlier this year um, in the northern part of the country that they discovered young people that were tied down. Um, in different places in the north um, and abused by their teachers. Um, there's also the issue of, of Almanjiri. Um, that's in the north. In the southeast, there's the problem of the IPOB um, and, of course, the Delta boys um, who have been fighting since the time of um, um, Sarawiwa, Ken Sarawiwa. Um, then I'd uh, like to come down to the Southwest where we have, um, we have uh, people like the Odua Congress and stuff like that. Um, so um, violence is not just in the, in the police and it's in... I'd like to like, um, sorry, I want to move to a place where there's more light. Um, there's no electricity in my house. Part of violence I saw far as a Nigerian. Um, so about three years ago, four years ago, um, 2014 specifically, the government came out and said, oh, we're bringing out a, um, a B, uh, an act that um, says that um, gay people cannot marry, they cannot congregate, they cannot basically taking all the rights of gay people away from them. And what happened in, in immediately after is that the police started arousing and targeting and profiling queer people, whether they are queer or not, and started extorting them. And there had been a lot of suicides, a lot of killings, and even by the Nigerian society itself. So 
The NSAS movement is the first of its kind that will be demanding for human rights. Usually when we go on the streets, we usually ask for, like I think four or five years ago, I think it was um, Occupy Nigeria, and people were demanding that the government should reduce the price of fuel. Even in previous protests, there's always, it's always been tied to one economic thing or the other. This is the first time in, in the history of Nigeria that people are actually asking for their human rights. And um, the violence in the society is so deep and so consuming that women that went out to protest were at risk of being raped or being groped or being harassed. The queer people that went out to protest that the, the, the police has been harassing and extorting them for years were discriminated against. They told us to go back, that our issue is not now, that even if the government is saying, we have taken away all your rights, you have no right to come and say we should, because you are not heterosexual, you don't have a right to come and say we should, um, the government should give you your own human rights too. You have no right to come here and say, oh, we're queer and we're tired of being profiled by the police. Let the police profile you, but don't let the police profile us. I'm saying all these things to just introduce to you the, to like kind of bring in the different shades of, of um, violence that's been going on in Nigeria for, for, for since before, um, independence. Um, yes, so there's a um, feminist call, a group of women who banded together and started looking for ways of ensuring that um, people had access to lawyers and had access to food and had access to ambulances. In fact, feminist call basically ran Nigerian government, ran the gov governance for two weeks. Till tomorrow, you still have people attacking these women and saying, oh, we'll come back to you later. They have a sense of like, um, it's the usual thing. Like they think that they, they have uh, a right to the labor of women. So that's how women and queer persons have been treated within the movement itself. So when we say NSARS and Soros, okay, there's also the shit that, that um, Professor Amin, Amin said about um, the thugs or the people that the, pres the, the government have called miscreants or hoodlums. And it is very funny because I have met with the so-called thugs and miscreants and hoodlums and they are disenfranchised young people who work as Kekena Pep riders, they work as um, um, motorcycle riders, they are taxi rider drivers, they do the, you know, like, like mechanics, they are, they are not um, educated in the Western world, but they, they have gone through a training and apprenticeship system. And, you know, these are young people that the government have gone out of its way to extort and to brutalize over the years. And I can tell you for free that they were part of the movement. The government came out and said, oh, uh, after a while, and it wasn't after a while, it was after the Lekki shootings specifically. And I would like to mention that, that shootings had been going on immediately the movement started. The Nigerian police had started killing people, started arresting people. I was arrested when I was coming back from, from protest grounds for taking photographs of policemen that were going to shoot at some people at Challenge. I was arrested, I wasn't arrested, I was violently kidnapped uh, in broad daylight with my son, we were taken and, and um, um, the, the, we were, were kept in, 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 a, in a, an isolated police station for two, more than two hours. And then afterwards, they kind of like try to like follow me home. I know it's part of their intimidation tactics, but I just want to say that it's not just the lucky, the killings that happened at Lekki, that Nigerian government had been killing people even before Lekki, and they've been killing people and arresting people even afterwards. So these so-called thugs um, that people are talking about that looted 
this um, palliatives, it started when some young people who I am sure were paid by politicians went to ransack the house of a king in Lagos and they found beside the house a warehouse full of COVID palliatives. Most of the palliatives had gone bad. They took these COVID palliatives and Suddenly, everybody knew and people were going to get their palliatives. Having these palliatives in there for entrenched violence so much in this society that the only way they know how to respond to calls for human rights is by being more violent. And I, I don't know about thugs, because like I said, they were with us from the beginning of the protest. I was there, part of the protest in Ibadan. So I know that they were there and they were as peaceful as can be expected until people started paying. I mean, we saw it happen in Abuja. They started paying people to go and attack protesters. And I don't even trust that these so-called thugs are like thugs. They are probably people for hire in the society already that they can pay. It is not the boys that are riding Okada in my neighborhood who were blocking the road and saying, we want our human rights. We are tired of being extorted by the police. We're tired of people from our ranks being arrested for things that they didn't do. We're tired of brutalization. I want our human rights. I have videos as evidence that these so-called thugs, just because they don't speak English, the government decides to like call them thugs and then they get their people to say, oh, so there's, there's food here. When you tell hungry people there's food here, what do you expect will happen? There was also the burnings. Um, the ones in Lagos was so ridiculous. Like why would poor people go and burn down BRT buses that carries them around? The government has like been so used to oppressing people, and this is not a Nigerian thing. It is a thing that is about blackness around the world. Right now in Uganda and other parts of Africa, people are protesting about their human rights and the government is responding with violence. We saw what happened with Black Lives Matter movement. Once you are a black person, you are automatically a criminal. So the next thing you have to do is to prove over and over again that you are not a criminal to the colonial masters. And that's the only way you will get to climb up the food chain to get to a point where you and members of your family are no longer declared criminals. It's a system of capitalism that is extorting and extractive. And that's, that's all I have to say for now. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ayodele. We now move on to Fiaso, and if you can start by giving us a brief introduction about yourself uh, before moving on to your uh, remarks. Thank you. Don't mute. Thank oh. you very much. Thank you. First thing first, uh, my name is actually Fisaya, not Fiaso, but it's okay. I know uh, these things happen. Um, I'm an investigative journalist. I am a former newspaper editor. I was editor of um, two of the three biggest online newspapers in Nigeria before I left to focus on investigative reporting. I wanted to, I, that was last year, June last year. I wanted to be able to cherry pick stories and go after them without being bound by um, daily newsroom routine. Um, uh, and I, I, I became interested in answers. I actually supported the answers movement because of so some of the things that my work uh, revolves around, you know, exposing corruption, exposing injustice, speaking for the voiceless, holding the government to account, speaking truth to power. Um, first assignment I did after I resigned from editorship was that. I embarked on an undercover investigation of Nigeria's criminal justice system. And I started from the police, I went to the court, I went to the prison. 
you know, cooked up an allegation, you know, got a pseudonym, pretended like I'd committed an offense, and then the police arrested me, refused to release me against what the law states, 24 hours if a, if a court is um, for within 40 kilometers radius of the police station, if not 40 hours, held me for five days, you know, took me to court, and I landed in prison. So essentially, I had five days in the police station during which they, they thought erroneously that I was a suspect, but indeed I was a journalist, and I experienced firsthand how the police treats civilians, you know. So when the NSAS protests started to gain steam, I, I, I mean, easily thought we were on the right path, you know, because sometimes I, I have always thought the social, economic, political problems in Nigeria have, have been there for too long. And when you try a method and it doesn't work, you try the next, you know. What I wanted to achieve through the pen, it didn't work. And some people thought they could do it through street protests. Why not? Now, um, the protest ordinarily should not have lasted that long. You know, it, it, it ended up turning into a tragedy that I think everyone regrets or everyone thinks could have turned out better. You know, because people were killed, houses were burned, businesses were raised, and then, as we speak, a lot of people are still counting their losses. People are still, people are still trying to recover, and all this was avoidable. In the first place, the protests went on for that long because of the complete lack of trust of the public in the government, in their leaders. It wasn't the first time the government was coming to pronounce the disbandment of the special anti robbery squad. It wasn't the first time that the government was coming up to set up a committee on a matter that the public was complaining about time and time again. It's just the strategy of the government to say, oh, people are angry. People are talking on social media. So let's just announce to them that we are going to do it. And then it stops, it stops at the level of the announcement. So the people did not trust, the protesters did not trust the government. And there was no way they were going to listen. They were not going, there was no way they were going to accept that a verbal pronouncement of the end to SARS meant their, their, their prayers had been made. For instance, the five-point demand that was accepted by the government, one of them is to release all detainees from the protest. All protesters that were detained, release them. And then the government said it had ended SARS, it had accepted the five-point demand, but it was still arresting protesters. You know, one of the demands was raise the salaries of policemen so that they are well paid enough to not see the public as their cash cow. It hasn't happened. One of them was psychological evaluation of all SARS policemen. That hasn't happened. There was an announcement that all SARS officials should report to Abuja the seat of power. They are talking about hundreds of thousands of policemen whom you made no provision for, no provision for transport, no provision for accommodation. Nowhere was it announced that, oh, 700, 300, 150 psychologists had been relocated to Abuja to conduct the evaluation. So it was clear that the government was just playing to the gallery. You know, protests continued. Good thing about this protest, which also ended up being the bad thing, or let me say the best thing that ended up being the worst thing, was that there were no leaders. It was an organic protest. From one state to another, nobody needed to force people out. You know, because police brutality is something a lot of people in Nigeria can relate with. If it hasn't happened to you personally, you know someone it has happened to, you know, you have some idea. So it was organic, it drew, and there was no one for the government to corner. There was no one for the government to bribe. There was no one for the government to intimidate. So logically, it caught fire and it went on from, from point to point. I, I'd also like to quickly add that during the protests, we saw in quotes, you know, in, in, in how, how do I put it, in, in a small form, in hypothetically, we saw the Nigeria of our dreams we saw protesters provide security 
They provided their own security. They provided their own food. They provided their own water. There was a day that a, someone who, an amputee, led a protest. And by less than 24 hours after, Nigerians were raising funds to get a prosthesis. People saw in that protest the, the kind of Nigeria that they wanted. And it was inevitable that such protests would go on you know, for so long. The turning point, turning point was that then the Nigerian government thought the best way to get the protesters off the street in the absence of leaders to negotiate with was to introduce talks. You know, the attacks in a number of places, by accounts of so many people, by common logic, the handwriting on the wall is that of government, you know. The irony about violence is that you can foment violence, you can start trouble, you can't end it. It's not a tap that you turn on and off at will, you know. You start it and then it catches fire and people latch onto it. And that's why at some point the violence then occurred, you know, burning of houses and all that. What would have helped at that point? I would have loved the, the arrowheads, you know. Yes, I said there were no leaders, but there were voices, different voices. I would have loved them to re-strategize at the point where it was clear that the government that I jumped to put this to then switch to the negotiation table. You know, that didn't happen. And that was the turning point of the protest. But again, I'm not blaming, I'm not blaming protesters for that. I'm saying that. It's the fault of the government. You know, if the government didn't think violence was the way to go, we wouldn't have reached a point where we're talking about one ton destruction of lives and property. In the end, we are where we are, and there are lessons for the future. One, in my lifetime, this is the first time a protest has genuinely, genuinely shaken the government. No one in this government would have predicted that a time would come when Nigerians would take to the streets, when you would shoot live bullets at them, as it happened in Lekki, even though the, the, I can't say for a fact whether the figures are high enough to constitute a genocide or a massacre, but it's clear that soldiers shot at protesters. None of them ever thought that a time would come when young Nigerians would protest and you would shoot at them and they would continue. I'm almost tempted to say that even youth didn't think they could do it. So it has happened once, they've tasted power. The youth have tasted the power on the streets. And I'm certain that it's going to continue happening. It, if, if the government continues in this style of leadership, and by government, I don't even mean necessarily the administration of President Muhammad Buhari, before Buhari, when it was PDP, it was the same. If Nigerian leaders in and out of power continue to think that they can carry on with bleak disregard for the needs of the people, the young Nigerians now understand that there is power on the streets. And I won't rule out that in the immediate future, they want to use that power again. I won't rule out in six months another protest or in one year because they've seen that no one needs to, con, con, to, to, to gather people and say, let's hit the streets. Once there is a common point, once there's something that the people can, can, can relate to, they can troop to the streets. I can only hope that this is all for the good of Nigeria. I can only hope that Nigerian leaders, wherever they are now, are asking themselves what they can do better. I genuinely thinking that the period when they can get away with these things is over, you know, and in the months, in the years to come, we can see some responsibility from the government in genuinely meeting the needs of the people and holding power not just for themselves, not just for their cronies, not just for their pockets, but for the greater good of the people.
thank you. Uh, we now move to Katie Ryan. Uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending today. I should say off, um, off, up front that I am not a Nigerian and I cannot claim firsthand knowledge of the NSARS protests. Um, I teach in the Departments of African and African and Studies here at KU, along with the Department of Geography. And for those of you joining us from, from around the world, this is a primarily white institution of higher education and we are in the Midwestern United States. And many of us who are coming here today, either from the US or from Kansas, we are a bit preoccupied at the moment, the fact that there were 68 million of our fellow citizens who voted to endorse and extend the leadership of a president who openly endorses the use of police brutality to serve the ideological and material interests of white supremacists in this country. Um, many of us today who are from Kansas were in the minority vote for all three of our Democrat candidates vying for congressional and presidential offices. And when this vote is certified, it's likely that Donald Trump just won Kansas by over 15 points. We know that residents of our counties around the state with some of the worst viral surges in the country overwhelmingly voted for Trump and our historian colleagues are quick to remind us that this is not coincidental. And finally, we know that COVID-19 cases in the US yesterday broke a record for the second day in a row with 120,000 new cases and Kansas is no exception here. So the news that we have been confronted with as Americans are dizzying and deeply disturbing and really difficult to comprehend. So for the KU students and faculty and all of the others from around the US today who have joined us for this panel, we know that it's difficult to look up and see our past and see past our current national morass. And it's probably of little consolation to hear that the whole world, including our Nigerian colleagues here today are watching and worrying alongside us. Nevertheless, I think it's important to acknowledge that we see you and we're grateful. I also imagine that many of the Americans here like me are hungry to understand and learn from our Nigerian counterparts as we also are struggling with the contradictions of our own violent and dysfunctional state. And this panel has shed light not only on the political status quo that upholds and defends the use of violence against marginalized communities, um, but also how Nigerians, especially young Nigerians, are speaking up and resisting social objection. And they're making claims for their humanity um, through new forms of solidarity. Americans and our students in particular, we have a lot to learn from this global social movement. So I wanted to use my time, my brief time on this panel to call attention to just a few of these really critical lessons. Um, but first, just a really brief background on from where I come from. I'm a medical anthropologist by training and I am by no means a political analyst. Um, and like most people around the world, I have read voraciously everything I could on NSARS. The interlinkages between culture and health in Nigeria have been a focus of my studies and my research for the past 20 years. And I am no less passionate now about this country than when I first came to Nigeria over 2002, 2003 as a Fulbrighter in the city of Jos. I've spent considerable time in Kano and across the North. Um, and later as a faculty member, I returned and lived in Lagos for a year. And now over the past few years, um, I've worked with colleagues at the University of Calabar. So I've really had the privilege of living with families in communities in the North, the Southwest, the East, um, and just immersing myself in people's everyday lives. And I've learned an awful lot, but mostly I've been humbled by how little I know about this country and how quickly what you think you know changes. Um, 
And because most of my time recently has been following surgeons in hospitals, I have a very different vantage point than many of my colleagues here today. But I can attest just as loudly as everyone else to the disenfranchisement and the social abandonment of young people in Nigeria from the perspectives of their hospital beds and the tables and surgical theaters and that these are real and palpable and we're talking about questions not just of, of harassment, but really of life and death. Um, and, and I can also say that like anyone who has spent even just a few hours in Nigeria, it's hard to not be acutely aware of the harassment and threats and violence perpetrated by Nigeria's police and the constant, constant fear of armed robbers and militants that, that haunt just about everyone. So I wanna just do a very quick overview of what I have learned and what I hope our students have taken away from this today and some themes that I think really matter here about what it means to be a Nigerian and a young Nigerian or even an African in, in claiming for who you are and what you believe in and how different kinds of forms of belonging and connection can take shape in the midst of these protests as well as the multiple rifts in which exclusion takes shape. And this is really important because when we talk about police brutality as Americans, we're primarily talking about a tool of white supremacy. And what we're talking about when we see police brutality in other contexts around the world, it is equally about religion and ethnicity and nationalism and, and rifts that take all kinds of shape and form. And in order to truly understand whose interests police brutality serves, we need to understand class and gender and, and the legacies of settler colonialism and, and politics and colonial politics and policies in this country, in Nigeria and in all across the world where, where young people have, have protested for their human rights. I think colonialism and understanding the particular ways in which police and military violence have been used as a form of subjugation in the colonial context is a really important part of the story of Nigeria. Um, how governance currently works in the ways in which um, police are being equipped with only their brute force as a means of investigating crime about neoliberalism and the ways in which free market forces have only further put money in the pockets of a very few Nigerians to the expense of the over 100 million people who still live in tremendous poverty. I've heard about health and humanitarian initiatives. So when boxes of endomine noodles are being held up in provisions for so-called palliatives or, or provisions for the poor who are trying to get by in an, in a, an incredibly devastating pandemic as a kind of political performance to demonstrate that there are so-called so -called thugs or, or, or hoodlums in this country just willing to do anything to justify the use of police. Um, when in fact, I think it's really important to see the ways in which the poor are being scapegoated, that they are themselves having to prove that they are not criminals only to exert or, or to access the very basic provisions of getting by. Um, that this is a real, and this is an important reality that many, um, that many Nigerians live with every day and not just in the context of the recent protests. Um, I think there's a question that our colleague James Yaku has been grappling with in his writings about modernity and how Nigerians, young people's claims to modernity and modern identities, access to the very tools and technologies that connect us to people all around the world, our laptops, our phones, our hashtags, are so much at stake and are so much being one of the rallying points for participation. 
Um, and, and how do we think through what modernity looks like through these lenses? I think I wanna just shout out to the Africa is a Country essay that Professor Yeku published the other day as a, as a good starting off point here. Um, and lastly, to think about performance, we have many of our colleagues in performance studies here today. And to think about how performance is being used, whether in protests, whether in political performances, as a means of, of trying to convince viewers of, of particular narratives that really don't make much sense for the local people who are, who are really trying to just live or just get by. And I, and I think we need to really interrogate how these performances are working and counter performances are working to defy and to, to show, to showcase solidarities that the whole world is, is consuming through digital social media. Um, and these are just a few of so many of these themes. Um, I think, I think for our young American students who have joined us today, I want to just recognize how extraordinary it is to have a panel of such incredibly knowledgeable journalists, activists, faculty, researchers, policymakers here today, and to really make this a kind of firm endorsement of why we need students to study African and African American studies in the US because there are so many overlaps and so many needs that we, we can, there's so many things we can learn from in this movement that help us understand our own local realities here. So thank you for giving me this short amount of time today. Well, I would like to thank our panelists uh, for the opening remarks. Uh, so before oh, I open the floor uh, for discussion, I just want the panel to, uh, the panelists uh, to reflect on this uh, answers, hashtag answers uh, movement. Uh, uh, what does it mean for the general African continent? So we see uh, instances of uh, police brutality uh, in other countries uh, on the African cont continent. And we are seeing the citizens of Nigeria taking a lead role uh, in um, uh, uh, leading that protest against uh, police brutality. So uh, how can we extend that conversation beyond Nigeria to cover the entire African continent? So what does the NSAS mean, movement mean for the entire African continent? Um, if, if, I, if I may answer the question, what does, what does the NSARS movement mean for the African continent? Um, like I said earlier, the, um, the continent is already in a lot of upheaval and people are coming to recognize that their humanity is so much more important than, than fuel or like a lot of things that it's attached to beyond food. They've come to recognize that to even access opportunities, they need to access their human rights, um, which I think is happening in places like Kenya and in Uganda and I think Sudan, I'm not too sure. Um, women are protesting and, and people are basically protesting for their rights. And I do believe that if these movements can connect, but like Fisayo said earlier, the NSAS movement does not have a leader. It's totally, it's totally um, organic. And there isn't like one person that is saying, oh, we're rallying this thing. And it's because basically of the distrust of the people towards the government, because the government is always like, like, being valid towards leaders of, of uh, protests as we have seen over again. And Africa also has to come to a place of recognizing that nobody's coming to save us, that we are the only people that can save ourselves, that it's only us that can save ourselves. Thank you.
Uh, and I, should, I, I would also want to remind uh, uh, the attendees that uh, you can use the Q&A function to submit your questions. Okay. I think on the African dimension, the NSAS hashtag is always associated with end police brutality. And when you look at that second uh, hashtag, it's really true for most police forces uh, in Africa. And you can see even on Twitter, in a lot of other African countries, they've been saying, but our police are just like that also. So there is really a generalized situation in which the police is characterized by two core elements. One is brutality, and the second is extortion of the community. I think uh, part of why the movement in Nigeria had to grow its voice was because of the extent of the extortion that has come. They realized people's bank accounts are on their phones, and they could actually go through your phone and find out how much money you have, so that the extortion is no longer the normal extortion of what's in your pocket, but also what's in your bank account. And they hold you hostage while they continue to milk you. And what that opened in the eyes of the youth is that this can only get worse. So we've got to stop it. Let me make the general point about policing in Nigeria. We have, nobody even knows the real numbers, but the estimate is that we have 350 police officers in the country. Out of these, 150,000, that's about 40%, are on permanent VIP guard duty. So the police is not even available for police work because they are guarding not just senior government officials and politicians, but any business person that can afford the services. So the Nigerian police is available for sale. It is not available for policing the communities and ensuring safety. In that situation, therefore, it becomes a threat to community and its members. And that's why the red line had to be drawn. Thank you. Uh, so we have uh, two uh, op questions, uh, open questions from the audience. Uh, but before we move on to those questions, I just wanted to open the floor to the panelists. Uh, if you have uh, a question that you would want to ask uh, your fellow panelists um, uh, for the next two or so minutes. Okay, so it looks like uh, uh, we are fine. So this uh, question is uh, from uh, Nicole. Uh, uh, Nicole uh, and um, Nicole says, uh, I very much appreciate the discussion about the intersectional uh, oppression of queer Nigerians within this struggle. Uh, can uh, Professor Olofin Tuande uh, speak more to the to intersectional organizing? that protects the human rights of queer Nigerians within the larger hashtag NSARS struggle. Intersectional organizing is a pivot or is a vital pivot of Black Lives Matter organizing internationally. Thank you all. So Ayo, the question is directed at you. Okay. I'm not a professor, <laughs> I'm just ideally. <laughs> um, that being said, um, I'd like to point out the fact that um, queer, um, the queer movement didn't just start organically or just started because people were tired. It started because um, the queer community has been, um, has been um, oppressed for so long that within themselves, they've been organizing 
um, educating, supporting, um, funding everybody to make sure that people are at least um, comfortable. And they have been fighting back the state in so many ways. Um, for example, um, last year, the Lagos state government went to a hotel and arrested 57 men and accused them of being gay. They put them in jail and did not grant them bail um, until TIERS, one of the queer organizations in Nigeria, took up that case. And before the 57, there has been several times that the, um, the queer community has had to stand up and go and um, resist um, the, the, the police asking, they will arrest people arbitrarily and ask you to pay for bail. So the queer community has been organizing lawyers um, for uh, people who have been arrested and getting them out on bail without paying. Um, and they have also been doing lots of teach-ins and, and trainings about human rights and also um, creating small communities of love and support. So love, like one thing that has been lacking, all the things we've been saying is the respect for human life and, and love. And, and it, that is actually why the queer community was able to boldly come out because they have a support system already in place and they know that if they are arrested, somebody will come and bail them out. They know that if somebody tries to like be violent towards them, there are other people that will be there to protect them because they have spent years, especially since after 2014, protecting, we have learned to protect ourselves from the larger Nigerian society. And we have learned to build literally to communities of love and support. And I think really that's what actually happened during the NSAS movement that made people bold enough to come out with a lot of confidence because they, they have learned yeah. about Nigerian laws, the Nigerian constitution, the, their rights as human beings, the, the protocols of the UN. And, and these are things that like enabled them and the sectionality of feminism within the queer communities in Nigeria that has been facilitated mostly by two um, major queer um, organizations um, and has seeped through the community into the um, larger or whatever, because even during the protest, um, there were queer organizations that sprang up to, pro pro to provide um, temporary housing for queer protesters that were caught uh, during the Lekki protest. They, they provided um, medical care for some, somebody that was shot during the protest. So um, this, I, I think it's just basically the love and the desire to protect and educate one another that, that kind of led to that. It's not something that happened suddenly, something that we've been working on over the years, um, building up on. Thank you so much. I hope I've been able to answer your question. Well, thank you. Uh, so this uh, question, the next question is uh, from Chuka Okeke. Um, so this question is directed to uh, Professor Ibrahim so the question is, uh, there's, a palpable, there's a palpable gulf of distrust that exists between the Nigerian populace and the state. To some degree, the lack of trust inherent in the Nigerian system prolong, prolonged the la lifespan of the NSAS protest. What steps do you think the state should take to regain the, uh, the trust of the citizens? Thank you. Uh, there is a very deep uh, trust deficit between Nigerians and the state. And it's for very good reason. The state does not keep to its constitutional responsibility providing for the security and welfare of citizens. But it's also the fact that the state is always deceiving uh, citizens. And I think uh, there's a sense in which every state does that, but to what extent do you do that? When, for instance, in January 
2019, the police force announced their disbanded SAS. And everybody clapped for them and waited for the disbandment. Then they came back two weeks later to say, after successfully disbanding it, they've set up a new unit called Federal SAS. And this is totally different from the old SAS. But every day, what the Federal SAS was doing was exactly what the old SAS was doing. Uh, so the change he was adding the word uh, federal. And people felt that that was really uh, taking the people as fools. It's not just that the state is not doing what uh, it says it was going to do, but that it's treating people with disdain and lack of respect. So how can the state begin to gain back the uh, trust of the people. I think the first thing is to address the core issue of impunity, that these police officers break the law and engage in criminal behavior with impunity. Though the few that have been charged to court and the court has ruled against them were not even dismissed from the police. So that impunity was something that people found completely unacceptable. So the first is the question of accountability. The state has to be able to punish police officers who engage in brutality or criminal behavior to citizens. It is when people begin to see that accountability, that confidence, will begin uh, to return. The second issue is police reform. I made the point that 40% of the police force does VIP guard duty. So they don't have enough personnel to do policing. And precisely because of that, the army is called in to handle issues of social uh, unrest because the police are not available because they are guarding rich Nigerians. So the question of police reform is extremely important. And Nigeria has an interesting history with police reform. In uh, 2002, in 2006, and in 2012, presidential panel, uh, police reform panels were set up by three succeeding presidents, Obasanjo, uh, El Adua, and Good Lord Jonathan. All of them made extensive recommendations for overhauling the police. None of those recommendations were ever implemented. So there's an issue of whether the state itself is ready to make the police accept reform. The indications throughout the Fourth Republic is that the police will not accept reform and the state has no capacity to force police to reform itself or force reform on it, which means the police is not ready to change its behavior towards citizens. And there has to be some indication that the police is going to take reform uh, seriously. And part of the, I, I've read the reports, I mean, the three reports are very similar. One of the main issues that was raised in the reform is that there's a problem with the structure of the police budget. Most of the resources that go to police are consumed by the Office of the Inspector General of Police, and that at the level of the police station, there's literally no resources to carry out police work. This means because they have no resources from the budget to do ordinary police work, police in their police stations have to engage in extortion to do anything. So it's a structural problem that has to be addressed if we 
are to move forward. And the reason why the Inspector General won't accept reform is that his office is the main beneficiary of the lack of reform. Can a Nigerian government understand these findings from presidential police reform panels and implement it? That will be the key question in determining whether we could move towards rebuilding uh, trust. So there's a sense in which the problem of the police is much deeper than uh, the SARS issue, which is specific to brutality and extortion. And the police as a whole is not able to function as a normal uh, law enforcement agency. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Ibrahim. Uh, so the next question is uh, from uh, Liz. Uh, so uh, she's saying, um, uh, can the panelists comment on the mood of people, or communities, as they see around them currently in Nigeria, given the dramatic and tragic events of the past several weeks? So what's the general mood of the people uh, and communities around Nigeria, given the tragic events of the past several weeks? So if I can respond to that. Uh, so right now, it's... There is calm, you know, especially in a city like Lagos where I'm based. After weeks of protests, after destruction of property, of businesses, the looting, now people just want to get on with their lives and it's understandable, you know. Um, up to now, the police are not yet back on the streets. Of course, a number of police stations were... were, were raised. Some policemen were killed as well. The police are not back on the street. Um, generally, uniformed officers are not fully back on the streets. Even officials of the Lagos State Traffic Management Agency are not yet fully back on the streets. So in a place like Lagos, there's a lot of traffic. There's great lot of traffic in so many places where traffic officials would typically, you know, ease the movement of people and vehicles. So it's been, the consequences are still there. And then generally people just want to get back to normal living. The major protagonists, the protagonists of the NSA protests in Lagos, majority of them are in hiding, you know, because the government still wants to deal with them. Apparently, uh, one of them complained just yesterday about the seizure of her passport. She wanted to travel out and then the immigration told her she couldn't because she was under investigation and nothing has been, has been said about it too. The government is still hounding those it perceives to have spearheaded the protests. Uh, but the generality of the people just want things to get back to normal, want us to move ahead. But of course, the youth, there is still that sentiment that this never quite ended well. And that's why I said, Ella, I'm hoping the government can do better, can clean up its, its house and give people um, something to look forward to as an offshoot of, of, of all that has happened. Well, thank you, uh, Fisayo, for um, the response. And my apologies for mispronouncing your name earlier on. Uh, so this, the next question is from Stacy, who says, uh, can you talk more about the role of class within the NSAs? Uh, we know that uh, a wealthier or wealthier appearing youth have been targeted by SARS. And as Ayo Dele pointed out, the poor have been widely demonized for seizing food supplies. How has the movement uh, uh, overcome class divisions? Okay. Um, okay. Maybe somebody else should answer. No, no, no. Besides, you, you, you want to. Okay. So, just to say that, two two ways from my opinion, from my point of view, two ways of looking at it. Among the protesters themselves, there was nothing like class. You know, there wasn't. Mm. The feminist coalition, for instance, that got donations, you know, to to keep the protest going, didn't care whether it was one man who sleeps under the bridge 
that was you, you know at Lekki Togate or mm. someone who left the, the mm. highbrow equal in Lagos who was that they didn't care. Like mm. I said earlier, one mm. day of protest was led by an amputee. The following day, Nigerians came together, contributed money to get a, an artificial leg. So among the protesters, look, adversity unites people regardless of class. Anyone who had been at the end of police brutality did not care about class at that point in time. They just wanted to speak with one voice. Perhaps this was the first time in decades that young Nigerians were coming together and they were not thinking of race, they were not thinking of um, political leanings, they were not thinking of, of gender, they were not thinking of, of social status. Everyone just wanted to speak with a voice, you know. But the opposite way, you know, the government that was um very unhappy with the protest you know would go after the 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 high up there in terms of social status by seizing their passports would go after the vulcanizer the driver the mechanic who protested by threatening them you know so in the aftermath of what went down at Lekki, I've tried to speak with people, and then you find out that the artisans generally are afraid, are scared. They don't want to speak. They feel once the government shows up at their doorstep, they have nothing to, to fall back on. So it's easy for the government to suppress the voices of the poor. And um, on the other hand, what they do is hound uh, those they perceive to be, to, to be well connected. Maybe Ayo wants to add a few things. Yeah, actually, you're right about about the artisans and how there, um, there was this unification and it was the government that came in with their divisive, divide and rule things. Um, I'd also like to, to, to address the fact that the, the, the point that, uh, that there was no leaders actually is what has saved the movement um, because the way the government behaved during the protest and the way it has been behaving even afterwards shows that they have absolutely no intention of ending brutality against people and making people leaders only makes them targets. Once they find out they can't, that they can't um, um, maybe give you money or give you a, a, an SSA position or something and you'll be all right, they will come after people, and like, like Fisayo rightly pointed out, people who, who are not like, um, I call them the undocumented masses, not that they are poor, because even within that, um, that, that there are people who are quite rich. I mean, even amongst co-vulcanizers, it's just that they are not well connected because they do not, they did not go to the kind of schools that would give them connection to maybe the the IG or some top police official that will get them out of prison. And that's the only thing they're afraid of. So, yeah. Maybe if I could just uh, differ a bit on this matter. I think class matters very much on issues of police uh, brutality. Uh, I accept the point from Ayodele that there's so much violence against everybody in this country, but police brutality is targeted mainly at the poorest in society. Our legal yeah. system has provisions against vagrancy, loitering, uh, people who cannot prove they have a formal job. So they suffer more from police brutality than the wealthier uh, members of society. My own understanding of why NSAS became a significant movement was that that police brutality started getting in, extended to profiled targets within the young, upwardly mobile uh, community. And this is a community that was much more conscious of their rights and had the means to fight against it. 
So I think the class dynamics is very present and it is important. Of course, I accept the argument both Ayodele and Fisayo made that in the protest movement itself, this class differentiation was subsumed under a common interest that they all suffer from police brutality. But the fact of the matter is that the way a young person with a good job and a good income can respond to police brutality is totally different from the way a declassé element what they are now called the hot looms in Nigeria, is able to respond. And if we don't understand this class dynamics, I think we can get, give a misleading uh, picture of the reality. Thank you everyone for, for your comments. I, I wanna be thoughtful of everyone of our time and, and also that we're managing uh, time throughout the world here. So we have, uh, we have other obligations and we, we did schedule this for an hour and a half and Zoom seems to take up a lot of our time these days where people schedule meetings back to back to back to back because they think because we're not moving anywhere, Zoom can just take over. So I wanna thank again everyone for their wonderful comments. I think that we hope we will continue this conversation uh, in the virtual space on, on social media. Um, I know that James was tweeting as, as, as we were going along, so I know that we'll have some comments there. We had some questions that we did not get to, uh, and I do apologize for that, but we, we do have those time, time, time constraints. Uh, I want to thank our, our co-sponsors as well, uh, the Kansas African Studies Center, the Department of Geography and Astro Astronomical uh, Sciences. I must really mess up that word. Um, and uh, again, uh, all of our panelists, uh, this was a wonderful event. And I think it really speaks again to the, um, the breadth and depth of our department. We've been together for 50 years this year. Uh, and as I started, as I explained when we, uh, we started, one of our founding documents explains that we, are go we were created to speak to the urgency of the development of African peoples, both on the ancestral soil of Africa, as well as in the Americas. And I think, again, this panel speaks directly to that and something we've continued to do over 50 years. So again, I thank everyone for joining us uh, and uh, taking the time this morning and this evening for this extremely important conversation. And um, I hope everyone has a good rest of the day and a good evening uh, to those in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you.